for having me here. Uh, it's a great pleasure. And uh, thanks for the nice introduction, Vanessa. Uh, my name is Erzsébet Tócifra, and as Vanessa told, I'm the Open Science Officer of the European Research Infrastructure, DARIA. So the alternative title of my talk could have been uh, DARIA and her sister research infrastructures, what's in them for you? Um, so what follows is pretty much a crash course to DARIA and uh, her sisters, and how we push together forward an open research agenda that actually works for the humanities. Um, here you can find a link uh, to my presentation if you want to follow it along on your own devices. Hopefully the link works, hopefully uh, the PID behind the link also works. So we are going to cover uh, first, we are going to talk a little bit about why we need research infrastructures, because I know that it's sometimes a pretty mysterious concept. Uh, and I wasn't strong enough here uh, to preach why we even depend on research infrastructures and why we need infrastructure of thinking. Um, then we are going to see how it all relates, how it's all about open science. And later at the end of my talk, we are going to zoom out a little bit to the European perspective. Um, but first, let me start with a confession. Uh, let me reveal, uncover some of my biases that explain a lot uh, about why I care so much about open science and open access. So I think in my case, it started with some illegal copies of corpus linguistics textbooks. Because as a Hungarian research, researcher in linguistics, uh, I'm coming from an academic environment where um, uh, traveling to foreign countries and visiting libraries uh, there is to, to uh, study cultural artifacts or to get access to the latest scientific publications is still a usual scientific practice. So basically we had to back then cross physical geographical borders in order to cross virtual ones such as paywall. Uh, it's pretty bizarre, isn't it? Um, but then soon I also need to realize that, uh, as Charlie also pointed out in the introduction, um, open access is only the tip of the iceberg. So think about all, the, all kinds of scholarship uh, that remain hidden if we only focus on access to traditional scholarly outputs, such as books and journals. Um, as one of my uh, dear colleagues, Paula Maschutzer, puts it, research outputs now encompass far more than can be expressed in the 17th century construct of the scholarly paper. Scholars deserve to be uh, uh, given, sorry for the typo, uh, credit for the many contributions they make above and beyond the articles. So getting above and beyond the scope of the article, um, the question that is very important to us is um, how to maintain and where to maintain these novel forms of scholarship. How can we sustain them in a publicly maintained environment in meaningful ways? And we do have to think about these questions because otherwise uh, our work either remains on hard disks or uh, other bigger entities, corporate entities like Google or Elsevier uh, are also thinking about these issues. Mm. And so it should be clear uh, by then that the researcher requirements of the 21st century uh, cannot fully cover it, are no longer completely covered by <coughs> library, libraries and archives, not even the digital ones. So as the scholarly production moved from the bookshelves to the computer racks, uh, Digital cultural institutions are increasingly challenged in their capacity to sustain all the work that is produced by us. Um, and another problem is that um, the knowledge, the scholarship that is created around these novel types of digital objects also happens in different specific contexts, in different institutional silos. So the question is, um, how to, how to connect these silos, how to, how to connect these different knowledge fragments. 
um, that has been created around uh, these digital objects. So I think this is pretty much a good argument for why we need research infrastructures. And so luckily, um, this need has been recognized on the national and institutional levels. This is why we can be here. Um, so institutions recognize that they have to make collective investments into uh, knowledge creation, knowledge preservation services. Um, they have to fund them collectively because otherwise uh, they are not able to maintain them individually. And luckily this need to, to uh, think in long terms and invest into this infrastructural needs has also been recognized by the European Commission at a certain point. And they gave rise to a quite a complex legal framework, what we call ERICS. Um, ERICS is, uh, an ERIC is a, a re European Research Infrastructure Consortium, is a legal framework uh, that enables uh, and institutions on the national and on the European level to collectively invest in research infrastructures. So DARIA became an ERIC in 2014, along with uh, our sister research infrastructure, CLARIN, uh, which is an infrastructure for language resources. And so the rest is history. Um, currently, we have uh, 17 member countries and 11 cooperating partners. So you can see that uh, Austria is a proud member of DARIA. Still, we don't have such a thing as DARIA RT. Why? Exactly. So um, you're in quite. <laughs> the eminent, yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, you are in quite a lucky situation because uh, in Austria and in many other, uh, in some other um, German-speaking countries, uh, these two research infrastructure, Daria and Clarin, coexist. Um, and it's a very efficient setup, I have to say. So an important thing is that, uh, is that um, if you are a member, if your country uh, is a Daria member, it means that your country uh, makes a very strong statement for the value of humanities, but also for the value of Europe. So let's see what we do. Um, we do many things actually, uh, but all these many things uh, can be centered around four key areas of activities. Um, first of all, we are doing the classic infrastructural thing that is uh, we make tools, resources, services and methodologies that are important for our research available in the form of an open marketplace that is currently very much in the making. Um, we can talk about it later, maybe in the afternoon. Um, we also do training and educations of all kind because uh, uh, as it was pointed out by Martina earlier today, um, um, open science and digital skills are not always part of our university curricula and we need to Excel. We need to equip our researchers at all career stages with all the skills that they need to excel in this digital and open ecosystem. Um, we are also connecting uh, researchers uh, with similar research interests to do, to do research collaboratively. Um, and maybe uh, later I will, not maybe, uh, I will get back to this later. And finally, we are also uh, participating in key policy bodies like the Open Science Policy Platform to give a strong voice to arts and humanities in the European policy debates uh, about the future of scholarly communication or a future of science itself. Um, this latter might seem quite abstract, but it's about your future uh, research environment. So for instance, uh, lately we were pretty vocal about Plan S. By the way, how many of you heard about Plan S? I like this table. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so let me talk about the Daria working groups a little bit in a little bit more detail, not only because uh, they really form the heart of Daria, but also because um, um, uh, joining one of the working groups is probably the easiest way for you to engage with DARIA. So what are the working groups? Um, they are a very bottom-up, self-organizing uh, 
transnational research communities that are formed along shared research interests. That is, if you are uh, working at the University of Graz, let's say, and you're interested in something a little bit more specific topic like music and AI, you don't necessarily have a huge network of people, fellow scholars <laughs> around uh, with whom you can share this passion. So you have to go to the European level and find a people with similar research interests. So this is what the Daria working groups are for. Um, they are, in this way, they are really connecting the knowledge silos. Um, and in many cases, uh, they not only do research, but they also develop and curate and maintain research tools and edu educational materials that are important for us. Um, and they also work as a reality check to us because um, this way we feel really, we stay really in court in the research realities in the current research trends, uh, which enables us to build a research infrastructure that is not very distant from the real needs of the real researchers. So these working groups are open to anyone uh, with an interest of a specific topic. Here you can, uh, at the Doria website, which uh, I forgot to put here, but you can Google it, uh, you can check them out. Uh, currently we have uh, some more than 20 active working groups. Um, you can take a look, like we have everything, music and AI, geo humanities, uh, NLP, uh, we are also having a wonderful, wonderful working group for uh, ethical and legal practices in arts and humanities research. Uh, maybe we are going to uh, learn more about this working group later, probably. Brackets closed. Um, so, and you can also, if you have a specific, you know, topic in mind, uh, you can also just uh, take action and start, get, get your communities and start one. Um, the process is quite simple, uh, the, um, the real bodies have to uh, approve them. And importantly, we also have a little bit of a funding for the working groups. Um, we uh, want to incentivize their very important work in this way. Uh, oh, and there is also a research data management working group uh, in the making. So if you're interested, you know where to find me. So let me give you a little teaser from their activities, uh, the tools and services that uh, they are creating, curating or maintaining. Um, you may even know some of them. Uh, for instance, the text grid, which uh, is hosted by Daria DE, the German Daria. Uh, any of you know uh, text grid or used? Okay, that's good to, good to see. So TextGrid, for the rest of the room, TextGrid is a virtual research environment for text-based sciences. Um, it enables you to create digital critical editions and interact with digital critical editions in a meaningful way. Um, and then we have the uh, Daria Clothing Course Registry, which is um, an interactive map uh, on which we collected uh, all the DH courses, digital humanities courses across Europe and beyond for you to explore. And uh, another favorite of mine is the so-called standardization surviving kit. Um, it's a service that had been um, originally designed in the framework of the Partners project. It uh, allows you to explore the standards that are used uh, in your discipline. Uh, and instead of, you know, receiving a list of these are your standards, end of the story, um, these standards uh, are embedded in specific research scenarios. So you can get something very lively, something very usable, along, discussed along very practical questions like uh, can I run my tool on your data? Can I see your annotations? Can I add my own? So it's something very down to earth because we know that in the humanities, the standards are uh, critical, but quite challenging issues. Uh, it's well less established than in other disciplines. And we also recognize that standards are just as much as a social issue as a technical one. So you can also explore the standardization survival. Okay. Um, and now this is the point of my talk when uh, you may remind me that I've been talking about Doria for more than, I don't know, 10 minutes now. And uh, 
I haven't even made the slightest mention about open science, um, but you know, if you think about um, preserving and sustaining uh, and making long-term available services that are important for us, uh, doing research collaboratively, building support structures around the research to uh, help its interoperability, to, to help the different heterogeneous data sources to talk to each other, these things, to me at least, pretty much align uh, with the basic core principles of open science. So it seems that many components and values of, open, of the open science paradigm are naturally and implicitly present in DARIA. And this is, and this is no surprise, because if you think about it, in many cases, especially if we are talking about digital humanities, um, we have to see that digital humanists working collaboratively, using standards, taking care of their data, uh, planning things ahead, uh, sharing stuff, um, they are also doing open science at its finest without even recognizing it. Uh, if you think like the best open science tools and standards, TEI, IIIF, stuff like that, uh, naturally, organically, emerge from research practices without necessarily being branded as part of the open science toolkit. So in some cases, open science come to, comes to us pretty naturally. But some other cases. So as Charlie mentioned, and now I feel uh, free to kind of just, it's just a quotation of him. <laughs> Sometimes open science can be pretty painful. That's what he said. <laughs> It's because we see a huge implementation gap sometimes uh, between the principles and the practices and the policy uh, requirements and funders' requirements uh, more specifically. So sometimes even if, we, uh, even if we value the basic principles and care about the basic principles of open scholarship, like transparency, accountability, reusability, uh, equity, knowledge creation, sometimes we still find it very difficult to translate these everyday practices, everyday, these high-level principles into our everyday research practices. Um, sometimes open science seems very hard science-y for us. Uh, yeah, keywords like reproducibility, uh, no results, what is no results in humanities? We can discuss it in the afternoon, maybe. I, I have ideas, but so, or pre-registration of reports. And I know that sometimes even, sometimes even the use of preprints can uh, freak out some of the communities. Uh, I know it for sure. So these elements, these keywords of open science uh, might seem as sometimes alienating or requires quite substantial twists in our practices. But we do believe at Doria that open science works best when it's deeply anchored in the uh, everyday research practices, or more precisely, or even more importantly, when it organically grows out from uh, our own research practices, uh, in this case, in arts and humanities. So as a response to this implementation gap, uh, in early 2019, we launched the Daria Open blog, uh, which is a place to explore all sorts of pathways to the open research culture as it is specifically pertained to <coughs> arts and humanities research. So you can check out, um, you will find news, expert interviews, success stories. We are also planning to uh, go on with some failure and disaster stories in the future. Um, and also... <laughs> Do you have fun? Okay. Well, everybody is very welcome with disaster stories. Yes. Uh, and so uh, you will find all kind of discipline-specific uh, discussions about discipline-specific challenges around open scholarship. And it's also a nice place to amplify the good work that is done in our national consortium, for instance. Um, and we really like, like, um, I really like the fact that some of the blog posts from Doria Open had been translated into different languages. So this is also something that you're very welcome to do if you have uh, 
where did you say uh, lots of superfluous free time? You can go citizen sciencing and you can also do some <laughs> translations if you want. Uh, another service that we launched in 2019 uh, is the Doria Open Science Help Desk. It's a part of the bigger Doria Help Desk. Um, so you can send your questions uh, about all things open and hopefully we are going to be able to answer or if it's something uh, uh, very specific, we may or may not direct you back to uh, the, your national uh, consortium. Um, okay. And another, uh, another way in which we want to make the open, good open practices uh, visible uh, for a broader audience uh, within the uh, digital humanities domain is the Open Methods Meta blog. It's uh, actually an experiment with a uh, um, novel form of scholarly communication and community review. Uh, because at Doria we see that uh, that it's a major challenge in present day humanity, it's a major challenge for digital humanists to align their increasingly digital workflows with a sometimes very slow scholarly, scholarly communication ecosystem. So if I need to sum up with one single tweet why we need open methods, oh, okay, <laughs> this is quite symptomatic, but okay, mm -hmm. I, I, others can, okay, others can tell even, even more. Uh, scary stories. Okay, looking forward to that one, Essa. But so it says that a colleague and I have a chapter on literary network analysis forthcoming, still forthcoming, that on account of a long delay in publication has a footnote with the most controversy I've ever stuffed into a single sentence. Beep. Wish we had another few months and few thousands words to unpack it. And what you can see, it's 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 pretty it's pretty uh, uh, small. The bit, between this chapter's completion in early 2016 and its push to press in 2018. Uh, much has changed in the literary network analysis landscape. Although full treatment is beyond the scope of this chapter, this, 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 this. Uh, also deserve mention. So to speed up things a little bit, uh, we really need to experiment with alternative uh, uh, forms of scholarly communication that allow us to do the real communication that is running parallel from uh, with publication. So Open Methods is a meta blog, which means that uh, we bring together all sorts of uh, openly available content about um, digital humanities tools and methods. It can be a blog post, it can be a podcast, it can be a presentation uh, slides if it's comprehensive, it can be a research article, it can be anything. We bring together all sorts of content types, also those ones that are totally, that are rapid, that are prompt, that are reliable, but that are totally invisible from this official horizon of scholarly publication. Um, so the real power of the, and now it's totally legit why I'm talking to just take your phone, take your laptop and check out the platform and uh, feed us with interesting content because um, the concept behind open methods is that um, everybody can send us content that is relevant to digital humanities tools and methods. Um, and then um, the editorial team, which is a wonderful, wonderful team, uh, they are multilingual. Uh, it's uh, more than I uh, forgot to update the numbers because it's growing significantly. Uh, so now we have uh, uh, 28 editors from 12 countries who are all together speaking in uh, 17 languages. Um, also with, mainly from Europe, but also from the US and from Argentina. Uh, and they are community curating, they are community reviewing the all sorts of content types that um, we are receiving. So if this body of digital humanities experts agree that the content in question is of good quality as in the relevance uh, to the DH community, then we can be sure about it, that's this, uh, sure about that this is indeed the case. Um, uh, and another important feature of open methods is that it's multilingual. So multilingualism is a key value, not only in open science in general, but also it's something very important for us humanists, 
I really love the way that you were switching from uh, English to German uh, very dynamically. So we intentionally keep uh, uh, Open Methods Multilingual to give visibility to, to content in all languages because we are well aware that, um, that so there is important scholarly content out there that is not written in English. Okay, uh, we also do face-to-face uh, -face and all sorts of online trainings uh, because we see that uh, issues around open science, open scholarship, open data uh, are not always covered um, by the university curricula. So we try to democratize access to uh, these trainings and release them openly. Um, Recently, research data management dominates pretty much our training agenda. We are going to give uh, multiple winter schools in this semester about, on this topic. And I know that uh, since, since citizen science is an important topic in Austria, uh, I just want to um, drive your attention to a training module that had been developed uh, within, again, the partners projects. Um, this online training resource is called Partners Training Suit, and we just released one uh, training module on citizen science as it works specifically in the arts and humanities research domain. Spoiler, uh, we cover some uh, Austrian, some nice Austrian uh, humanities citizen science projects as well. Um, but speaking of data management, if I still have a little time, um, we also find it really important to not just pass on the funders' requirements, not just pass on and bring closer the big European agendas like what Vanessa mentioned, this fair data. Have, has anybody heard about fair data before? Okay, thank you. Um, so we are not only uh, grabbing what's the European requirement and bringing them to humanities research, but we also try to make these generic principles meaningful in our own research context, which for the data management, for instance, it means that uh, since the majority of humanities researchers, as one has already mentioned, um, are working uh, with uh, resources that are collected rather than generated, collected from cultural heritage institutions, uh, we cannot really make uh, our data fair without um, discussing these issues, reuse conditions, citation, etc. with the cultural heritage institutions. So we are trying to involve them in the humanities uh, research data management. Um, I have many disaster stories and, you know, big failures about what happened when people just realized not uh, um, right before the publication that, oops, I should have asked this and this and this and this for the archive. Now I cannot publish my stuff openly. Uh, so we are trying to integrate uh, the cultural heritage and the glam sector in our research data management activities. And it's uh, not a very uh, uh, good picture, but this uh, green little booklet is an especially uh, important resource. I link out to this at the end of my presentation. Uh, it uh, one I was also part of the part of the uh, author and editorial team, and, and uh, it gives you very useful advices uh, about how to deal with cultural heritage data to make it fair. Um, okay, so we have a little bit of time to have a look at the bigger picture because luckily we are not alone. So we, um, uh, here you can see our most important allies and acquaintances. Uh, so we developed partnerships with sister uh, research infrastructures and other affiliated projects who helps us to do a better job to achieve the same complementarities on the European level and to avoid duplicating the work and work together um, in synergies. Uh, so some of them might be familiar for you. How many of you know Clorin? All of you, of course, this is not a question. How about, how about Operas? Okay, my favorite desk again. Operas. <laughs> 
OverS is um, a research infrastructure specifically dedicated to uh, scholarly communication in a social sciences and humanities. Uh, so they invest a lot in what we call bibliodiversity, uh, which means that they want to enable all sorts of research publications, books, blogs, whatever, um, uh, so that they want to, that they, they are aiming for integrating all these kinds of uh, uh, alternative publication types, but especially books, uh, into the open scholarly landscape. So if you have ever had the pleasure to publish a monograph, then you might have an idea why uh, their, import, their work is really important. How many of you know, and uh, they, they are, uh, we are collaborating uh, with OPERAS uh, on different projects. Um, two projects started recently, OPERAS P and um, Triple, um, with, with similar aims. I will, happy, I will be happy to talk about these projects in the afternoon if you're interested or during the coffee break. And uh, we just finished the Hermios project, which aimed for the integration of uh, open access monographs into the digital scholarly communication landscape. So they implemented uh, services like they added persistent identifiers books, they interlinked books with ORCIDs, uh, they implemented entity recognition service in book publication workflows, and pretty interesting stuff. Um, how many of you know OpenAir? Okay, a little bit more. So open air is an e-infrastructure, which means that uh, it's not discipline specific. It's organized uh, pretty much around um, geographical lines. So Austria also has a um, note for open air. Um, they are very strong also in policy making, in um, open science education, uh, general, in uh, general scope. And I forgot to put for the Foster project to my slide, uh, which was a very, it's an it's a, a open science project that ended this March maybe, and um, they made a very important work uh, on uh, making freely available, uh, openly available, uh, open access, open science resources um, to the European communities. And this important work is now taken over by open air and hosted on their infrastructures. Um, we are also building interesting things together with OpenAir. Uh, for instance, currently a research community dashboard, the European level research community dashboard um, that is available also for uh, arts and humanities scholars. Um, but they are doing, as I told you, uh, lots of webinars and training and education events in open science in general. Europeana. Everybody knows Europeana, uh-huh. So this is the biggest European aggregator for cultural heritage resources. And what I told you about um, um, research data management in the humanities later, uh, earlier. Uh, so Europeana is a very important ally for us because we need to work together on uh, starting data management issues uh, from that very point when uh, researchers first interact with libraries or archives or museums or digital collections from Europeana. Um, so together with Europeana, Clarin and uh, Lieber and some other um, uh, research infrastructures, uh, we are working on the Cultural Heritage Data Reuse Charter, which you can also check out uh, on our website. Um, we are uh, working on protocols and mechanisms to facilitate the exchange between cultural heritage institutions and individual researchers and research projects. On the long run, we want to uh, make suggestions for data management plans that include this component, that include the agreement between uh, the heritage institutions and researchers. Uh, okay, and the last one is um, a truly bottom-up, absolutely community-driven uh, initiative, the Open Science MOOC, the Open Science Massive Open Online course. Uh, does it ring any bell to anybody? Okay, um, so uh, we have a big uh, community around this MOOC, a huge Slack channel. This is again a platform for interaction. You can ask uh, all your questions. Uh, related to open scholarship, to uh, the advisory board. Um, there are two 
training modules that are finalized, one on uh, uh, open research software and another one on open access to research papers. Uh, so you are very uh, welcome to check that out as well. So what I wanted to, I think what I wanted to tell you really that uh, my intended takeaway message of this talk was that um, so when open science, when open principles meet uh, with investments into research infrastructure, this is something very powerful. So this allows us to connect people who could have never met before, real or virtual or fictional one. Of course, it enables also machines uh, to connect machines could have, who could have never met before. It allows us to connect crowds and clouds, services and communities who could have never met before. But probably also most importantly, almost importantly, it enables us to connect knowledge and ideas who could have never met before. So this is why infrastructures are important to us in the openness. Um, here you can see some of uh, our resources with DOIs and proper titles. Feel free to explore them, reuse them and uh, give your feedback on them. Thank you. Thank you.